what's up, internets? Uh, it's Tobin. This is Fuzzy Tolerance Screencast number hmm, 18, I think. This is just going to be a rapid fire episode. Just answer some questions I've gotten and some things I think you might want to know. And uh, maybe even rant a little bit. Um, translation, didn't have a whole lot of time for this. So I'm just going to try to throw out some things that people have asked or might, I think might be useful or are things I've been thinking about. And we'll see how that goes. First, let's talk about some development tools and things I'm using in my toolkit right now. I have been a longtime user of Dropbox, and that is a really good way to, if when you're working on projects, to share your code between all the places that you're at. Uh, basically, uh, what I do is I just have a cold code folder in Dropbox and I put all my projects in there and uh, that's basically wherever I go from that point forward whether it's on a Linux machine or Windows machine or it's in the Charlotte office or from my orbiting HQ uh, it is all that code is synced up and all that code is exactly where I need it to be. The second thing I do with that is this code folder that I put all these projects in I basically just on Apache on whichever machines, whatever machine I'm at, I'm just share, just dumping that folder out through the HTTP server. So I make a new folder in code and I put a, a web a HTML file in there. I can get to it immediately from localhost for testing and development. So that's code everywhere that's ready to go with the web server everywhere for, lo for localhost development. It is really a good way to go. And Dropbox is, your first two gig gigabytes are free, and if you're doing web development and you need more than two gigabytes, uh, you're, uh, you're sharing videos or you're, you're, you're doing something wrong. So Dropbox is great. Now, what I, used for, what I use for uh, uh, version control for software development is Git. Um, Git is a distributed version control software. Um, there are a lot of different types of version control software you can get, different distributed version control software you can get. Uh, Git and Mercurial are my big ones. I kind of like Mercurial, still kind of like it a little better for the, the little kind of stuff I do. I'm not making a Linux kernel. Um, but Git is really what I use now. Uh, Git is what all the cool kids are using. And there's value to that. Um, when you go looking for help or or you want to play on GitHub, which is all Git, which is where all the cool kids go now too. Um, Git, Git is the version control system for that stuff. It, it's, it's kind of the winner in that space. So I'm using Git. And some of these code repositories in Dropbox uh, are, are Git repos that sync up to GitHub. Or if it's a self-contained project not going to GitHub, it just syncs up there. Um, a tip on that, it's cool to have Git uh, that shared out by Dropbox, but you probably only want to do, say, uh, say commits and pushes from one machine. The reason why is I'm on a Linux machine here using ext4 and at uh, the Charlotte office, I have a Windows 7 machine with NTFS. And the file permissions are different. And Git will kind of see that and go, all the file permissions changed. I'm going to commit everything. And that's not really what you want. So it's cool to share it that way. I would probably only do commits from one place. And unless you're just in a screaming hurry to do a commit. So that's Git. And I, I uh, that's Git. And I put all of my public repositories, which is pretty much almost everything I do, and on GitHub. That's just where all the everybody's at. It's a really great site. If it's a public repository, it's free. And uh, if you're looking for insight and help and suggestions on your code and make things better, that's the place to put it, because that's, that's where you're going to get the most eyes on it. So Dropbox, Git, and GitHub. Now, my favorite text editor right now is Sublime Text. And Sublime Text is just the most amazing thing. It's, uh, 
Uh, it's hard to describe. It's it's not open source and it's not free. It's going to cost you about sixty bucks, and that sixty bucks you're basically licensing you. So if I have a machine at work on Windows and one at Linux here, and if I had a Mac machine somewhere else, I'm buying that one sixty dollar license. I can put that software in anywhere I'm going to be working. So that's pretty cool. So it's cheap, especially when you consider. You know, you spend half your life looking at a code editor if you're a, a code monkey like me. And it it's it's very fast. It's very capable. It's you can tell it's written by somebody that writes code. It's not written by like a a design astronaut or a you know one one of those types. It's it's really very practical for writing code. And the the extension community is huge and open and really really great so I should say to you that it's basically nagware so you can download and run the whole full version and it'll just nag you every now and again to license it so you can try out the whole thing and see whether you like it or not now, a couple of my favorite extensions the first extension anyone should install is the package manager and that is the only one you'll have to install by hand it's like uh, what they'll do is they'll give you a you could install it by putting it in a folder and that kind of stuff by hand but you can actually just run this from the sublime text console and uh, it'll fetch everything and and install it once you do that you'll never have to install an extension by hand unless it's something just really esoteric now after that the package, my favorite packages, let's see, package, I've got a, a, a number of packages I use. My ones I just couldn't live without are Sublime Linter. Sublime Linter is basically a linting, um, which means it looks for errors and it also looks for things that may not be errors but are, are more styling issue sort of things and it does C, CSS, JavaScript, Python, Perl, PHP, Ruby, about anything you can think of and it's it, it's just neat stuff. Uh, let me show you a JavaScript example because it, it not only finds errors, let's say, what would be a good one? Oh look in here all right, we got a bunch of JavaScript. Let's here's something it's complaining about. Well, here here's an example of thing where it's not exactly an error, but it's bad form. JavaScript, when you're using like two equal signs, will try to convert both sides of the equation to the same data type. So if I have I have a number here, it's going to kind of behind the scenes try to convert that to a number for the comparison. If I had a string there, I'd try to convert it to a string. So it's basically, there's, that could cause a problem if you really want one data type and not another. So by putting in three equal signs, you're making that specific. But to do that, this might break it because all this, this data total rows is a number. The value that's coming across is like a number as a string. So I'll go to parse int data total rows and it's not going to like this either yeah here we go basically there are some number systems in the world that aren't base 10 believe it or not and when he's told it to parse it we didn't give it a number system it will assume 10 but it's it's not Crockford Crockford good Douglas Crockford is the he's the JavaScript man see now that's Perfect, great JavaScript. And that's an example of where it probably wouldn't have been an error, but it's a styling thing. When you're working on Python, it'll tell you things like, oh, in between these two different uh, functions, you should have two space, two line breaks instead of one, and things like that that are more styling. But it finds, you know, basic syntax problems like a missing semicolon or a closing bracket. It's I would not write JavaScript anymore ever without a linter running with it because I'm, I'm just not that smart. It's a huge, huge, huge good thing. 
Now the second thing I'll say I, I really like, extension, I'll close this without saving it, uh, is this uh, uh, NetTuts Fetch. Basically there are, every web developer has like some templates they've either built themselves or templates they use from somewhere else like uh, HTML5 boilerplate. It, boilerplate is a common HTML5 template with best practice kind of features. So you get that kind of stuff to speed you along. So one of the entries I have in here in this this uh, fetch settings, and you can get to those once you ins install the extension, uh, like fetch manage, and you'll see all your stuff. And to an, install an extension, all you do is you go to your package control and install package. You see it's just a huge list of packages the community's created. I mean just on and on, everything you can think of. Just even something like Markdown, you'll find there's, you know, half a dozen Markdown packages. So that's how you install a package like this. And this is actually under uh, uh, NetTuts. Oh, it's it's not listing it because I already have it installed. But uh, it's like NetTuts plus Fetch. And I'll put links to all this in the show notes. So if I'm starting a new project, I want to base it on the GeoPortal template. I'll just go Control Shift P to pull up my universal command tool and go uh, Fetch Package. And this the hyperlink is essentially if you go to your Packet, go to GitHub, say, right click on this zip. That's what that URL is. So it is getting an archive and it is getting an archive and unzipping it and everything for you. So we're going to grab that. We're going to give it a place to put it. Um, just test. And it will grab it from the GitHub repo and extract it. And you see now we have this test with all our stuff ready to go with that GeoPortal template. So that's a very quick time saver. You can use it to fetch uh, single files like jQuery here. Very, very cool. Now the last thing, last extension that I really, really like is called Live Reload. And I'll show you what it does right here. Let's get this over here. Get this over here. See if we can get this up and going. Now this live reload is a, a server side thing and a client side thing. On the server side, what it does, it sets up an HTTP server that's listing over a certain port and a client will make a WebSocket connection to it. And it's basically for development to keep you from having to hit, you know, switch windows and control F5. Because as, as a web developer, that's ended up being your whole life. Make a change here, tab over to your browser window, control F or F5, see what it looks like. Tab back over to your code, make a change, tab over to your browser, F5. You basically hit F5 all day long. And it's a real pain once you know how to not do that. So basically, that's the server side component. Is, and it's a, as part of an extension you can put in the slime text. On the client side in your browser, you'll install a live reload extension. And you see it's right now saying we're connected to this live reload server that Sublime's running. So we make a change over here. Let's say we'll make this empty map thing smaller with CSS. Hit save. You see it automatically changes it. And with CSS, it'll do it without refreshing the page. You can also, uh, this is like all like, working project code, so I'm trying to remember what I'm doing so it don't screw something up. Uh, if you do things to an HTML or JavaScript, it will actually re reload the whole page for you. So we'll put test here for the string right here. Hit save, it reloads the page and puts that in there. That seems like a small thing, but if you develop websites, wow, that is a huge time saver. It's a huge, Hands on the keyboard, reach over to the mouse, go over, pull up your browser window, hit F5, look at what you did. Of course you did it wrong. Go back over all day long. 
that just saves you so much moving and clicking and refreshing. It is, I wouldn't code again without that either. So those are my absolute must have sublime text extensions. Now a CSS tip, because I get people get confused about this all the time. Let's see. See what we got here. We got two boxes side by side. And they're basically width 50% uh, float left and right um, boxes. So they're exactly half the page. And I've set the page, um, basically set everything margin and padding zero, so we're not getting any page margin. This is like the poor man's normalize. Um, now it's 50%, you think that's great. I'll add a border to it. Border to pick solid black. And look there, I have live reload going, as you can probably tell. How could this be? This thing is only supposed to be 50% and knock that other div down. Well, here's the thing. The box sizing or the box model sizing by default is it doesn't take into account things like border, margin, and padding. So you set a box size of 50%, you add a margin, padding, or border to it, it's going to grow past that 50% because it's not factored in at all. And this just kills people left and right. I see that. It's 50% what that I'm having to like fake a percentage so it doesn't do this. All right, I'm about to save your life. Star box sizing border box. What that tells the browser, and there are some, uh, you'll, you'll want to put in a couple other extensions for it, and I'll show you in a minute. This border box, what it does is it tells the browser to that 50% is for the whole thing, including borders, padding, and margin. And that will save your life. Uh, I do this on about everything now. And some people poo-poo this star selector. Eh, it's from the, from the research I've done, it's really not as slow as people might think. Once you start shaving like five milliseconds, then I, I start losing interest. But that that will that will save your life. That will make you a happy person. Otherwise, the the box sizing with factoring in padding and margin and borders dr will drive you absolutely crazy. Now, a couple things about this star. I noticed. I'm not sure if it's true with the latest Google Maps APIs, uh, but before, if you did a box sizing border box that included the map div, it would screw around with the info windows. Um, and they might have fixed that, and I think they're on like 3.9 or something now. That might be fixed. But that's one little heads up. The other thing, let's see, can I use uh, HTML? Ah, uh, is this it? There's some really good, uh, this isn't the one I was looking for, but this will do. Um, box, uh, box sizing. Uh, it basically with IE7 you're screwed. Um, there's a like polyfill for that, but I I found it it's duh, doesn't really work right. Um, but you who cares? It's IE7. Who cares really? Which brings me on to my next thing. Actually, one more thing on this. Uh, uh, yeah, there's a Firefox thing. There's like a, I think with box sizing border box, you have to do like a Moz box sizing and a, uh, I don't think you have to do it for WebKit anymore. I think Mozilla might still need that. I'm not sure though. Hmm. But that's box sizing. It'll save your life. Um, now for browsers, since I just brought up Internet Explorer 7, because people ask me about browser support. 
And here's my thing with that. Uh, as a county, we support all modern browsers and Internet Explorer, the last three versions, which as of a couple of days ago is 10, 9, and 8. That means 7 Sayonara. That doesn't mean it won't work on our site. It just means if you call us with a problem in 97, we're going to tell you to upgrade your browser. If you call with a problem in 98, we're going to fix it. Now, i7 worldwide is down to about 4% usage. In the U.S., it's about 5%. It's a little bit higher uh, where I am because we have a lot of government people and a lot of bankers, both of which are only a notch or two above Amish in terms of technology. Um, but we go last three. Google actually goes last two. For people that are on 7, like say they go to one of my sites, they'll see a little yellow warning stripe that one that Google made that basically says you need to upgrade your stuff. Might still work, and we just don't support it. My thinking on that, because I've been asked, why shouldn't you support everything? And my answer to that is no. And there's three reasons, two of which are practical, and, and the last one I guess is also practical, but most people probably won't care about. One, supporting old versions of IE is incredibly expensive. It costs a lot of time, which is money, to do that. It can literally triple the cost of a particular feature. Because you'll do it, and it'll work great on, say, like IE9 and Firefox and Chrome and everything else. And then you'll, sp you'll do it in like an hour or so, and then you'll spend the next eight hours trying to get that to work and hack it up to work in Internet Explorer 7. It is really expensive to do that. The second reason is you end up not doing stuff in a cool way. You, you end up not doing things in a featureful way. You start to code to the lowest common denominator. I could go, you know, I could do it this super cool way. It's going to be flashy and great and people will love it. And then spend the next two weeks of my life trying to hack away for it to work in IE7. Or I could just do it this not as cool way, but it'll save me weeks of my life trying to hack it. So you end up with an inferior product. And the last reason is, and this is very important to me, but may not, probably isn't to everyone, is that it is kills your morale. The morale of your development group will, goes through the basement when you support really old versions of IE7. It's to have to try to debug on that ancient turd of a browser is, it's really hard to debug problems it's really hard to hack things in there that'll work for it and not break you know all everything else and all that work and frustration to get a feature to work that just should should just work it's just really bad for morale and uh, you know you there's some managers that probably think hey I'm paying these people to they're getting paid what morale do they want but development is a creative process and Developers with low morale are bad developers. You just don't want that. So that's why we don't support old, really old versions of IE. And thank you, Microsoft, for releasing 10. That means I can knock IE7 off my support list. And IE7 supporting that is a pain in the ass. So that's what we do in terms of browser support. I uh, got a question on video recording, and I changed how I do that. I'm using a software called Kazam for screen recording. And I'm using uh, something called Guac C View oh, for webcam stuff. And both those work great. I was using like an FFmpeg command that would uh, it, it just kill a toddler. Um, Chasm actually does a better job in recording. So. That's what I'm using now. It actually will dump straight out to WebM, and you can throw it right at YouTube. And they will probably reconvert it to WebM again because, you know, they're crazy people, and they got a billion servers on their hands. So that's what I'm using for screen recording. Now, one last thing before I go. I'm working off a list here. I think I, yeah, I covered everything but this. Because th this is – here's where I will rant a bit. So if you're not into rants, go ahead and – well, if you're not into rants, you're probably not watching one of my videos, but – 
I did a web comic recently that uh, was when I started doing web comics. I knew I was going to irritate people because I usually only inspired to do a web comic when I'm irritated myself. And I'm sure that carries right on through, even with my extraordinarily tiny artistic abilities. This one was kind of a, a rant on on Esri folks. Uh, there was a a uh, Steve on was on a uh, the the James Fee uh, podcast and he basically said Esri people are Esri has brainwashed their users. There's some truth to that. Everybody that's tried to pitch open source to a group of Esri people knows you can go in there and go look because Esri I'm an Esri user. They make a lot of great software, but they make a lot of software. And some of it's going to be great, and some of it's going to be eh, and some of it's going to suck. Just because it's a huge, you know, they probably have 30, 40 different products. So, and some of their server-side stuff is, I think, is where things start to get a little dicey. But everybody that's pitched open source software to a room of Azure people knows his experience. You can go in and go, look, we can do the same thing in half the time, in a tenth of the money, and it'll be a better product. What do you say? And have everybody just stare at you like you're an alien and then go back to using and complaining about their Esri software. So everyone's had that experience and that this is what that comment was about. Surprisingly, no, none of the Esri people complained at all. Um, I did get some, some not happy people because I stuck this at the end. Could have been worse. At least they aren't GISPs. And I got some GISP uh, non-fan mail. Um, just funny because they interpreted that and I can see how they did it now as GSPs are even worse than Esri people. It's not what I meant. What I meant was, um, hey, I'm looking, I'm making fun of Esri people, but hey, I'm not making fun of GISPs because I've done that before too. Uh, they kind of more interpret it as GIS people's people are worse than Esri people. And, you know, of course they're generally the same people. Um, so let me talk about GISPs for a minute. Um, okay, GISP, and this is, will just be my opinion. Uh, I mean, everybody, there are some a broad spectrum of opinions about GISP in the community. They all look at the same set of facts and come up with some different conclusions, and this is just my opinion, so take it for what it's worth. In a field where we have a sometimes an abundance of really bad ideas I think GISP is really the cream of the crop in terms of, of bad ideas um, basically it has no meaning it, it, it the only thing a GISP says is my organization had enough money to send me to enough stuff and to pay for my application so I'm a GISP and that's really all it says that's all it said from its inception, like five, eight years ago, whatever it is, all the way to today. I mean, we had somebody working in our group that we kind of inherited. He was near retirement, and they, they didn't know what else to do with him. And the last thing he'd worked on uh, was a time tracking software in Fox Pro for DOS. That gives you a frame of reference. Um, Great guy, absolutely great guy. He's, he's super, he's retired now. Um, and he did all kinds of stuff for us that we either wouldn't have done or would have done badly because no one wants to do it. He did software documentation, he did award applications and grant applications, some project management stuff, and GIS day type stuff, and all the kinds of crap just nobody wants to do. He even did some metadata stuff, which that poor bastard. Um, Great, great guy. Didn't know anything about GIS. Couldn't really tell you what a projection is. Couldn't really tell you what topology is. Couldn't really tell you, you know, he couldn't even name off some basic, like what are the basic feature types? Point line and polygon. Probably wouldn't be able to come up with that. Just not a GIS guy. But he was a GISP. Because we could afford to send him to enough, you know, enough conferences and whatnot to qualify to be a GISP. So he's a certified GIS professional. That's what I mean by 
the only thing it says at this point is that you have enough money to, you know, get through the process. You could be, you know, this this friend of mine I'm working with doesn't know anything about GIS as a GISP. You could have a genius somewhere else that they either don't have the money to go to the conferences and stuff, and or maybe they said, you know, 300 bucks to apply for a GISP, or we could spend that on beer and pizza, and they ended up making the right decision. Um, so it doesn't measure anything at this point. Now, they've been talking about making a test for many years now and even when they do that gsp is just not going to mean a whole lot what are they going to test you on what's a projection do you want to hire somebody based on they know what a projection is i it's i would rather hire somebody that knows a whole bunch of other stuff and i'll tell them what a projection is gis is such a broad field Certification GIS to me doesn't mean anything. It's like a I'm certified in IT. That doesn't mean anything. What does that mean? It's it's a, I mean it makes some sense to say be certified like the Esri certifications. I'm certified to use this particular Esri tool. They tested me. They ripped the software, and I'm certified. That makes a little sense if you're looking to hire somebody that can use that little that particular tool and you know rivet some stuff it makes sense if say there's a certification for a you know a water a hydrologist that has some GIS elements to it that makes sense to me because it's a specific skill set that they're testing not necessarily a tool set which is really what GIS is um, that makes more sense to me GIS certification Eh. I kind of know what they're, I mean, I don't know what they're going for. I haven't seen a WikiLeaks cable or anything, but I think what they're trying to do is they look at, say, a engineer's uh, sort of club in your state or a surveyor's club in a particular state. What they've done is you're now a certified, say, surveyor, and there is a lobbyist for the surveyors, certified people, and they've basically set up a job protection racket and the technology might change to the point where you really don't need a licensed surveyor for something but by golly we have written into law that you must be a licensed surveyor to do these activities and it's a job protection racket and i think they see kind of gis tools becoming things that regular people can use and they see well if we set up a a test in a GISP, then we can get our own lobbying group and we'll lobby to say to these particular kind of jobs, you have to have a GISP. And now we've protected all those jobs. To me, that is the dumbest. If you can train a monkey to do my job for three bananas a day, you should train a monkey to do my job for three bananas a day. Nobody owes me a job. I'll find something else to do. I mean, those kind of just job protection, they just drive me crazy. And the other reason I, I hear is, well, you know, now when you're a manager and hiring someone, you'll know they're a GISP. First of all, I told you about the guy that has GISP, he doesn't have GIS. But second, if you're in charge of hiring a GIS position and you don't know enough to be able to tell whether something someone knows about GIS or not, Get somebody else in the room with you. You know, tell your, you know, somebody at county over, or someone else, you know, that knows a little bit about GIS. Hey, come sit in these interviews with me. I'll buy you lunch. I'll pay you a couple hundred bucks, in which for a, you know, position you're going to have for a while is nothing. Just come sit in and help me out. You go, you will find somebody that will help you out. So that's my thing on GIS space. But and that's why I put that in the comic. Not to say that they're worse than Ezra people. They're mostly the, you know, there's a lot of overlap there. Is to say that at least I'm not making fun of them because I, I usually do. But since since it came up, I thought I'd tell you what my feelings on GISP are. But again, that's my opinion. Opinions vary, and I could be wrong. Anyway, that's the rapid fire for this month. I have no idea what I'm doing next month. Uh, hopefully next month will not be as busy as this one. You know, it's usually in government the last couple months of the year, the whole engine grinds to a halt. But this year has been really busy. 
So we'll see how it goes. Hey, I hope you have a happy Halloween. I'll catch you next month. Bye-bye.